We're running a little late, but we're okay with that. We're, uh, we're going to get started here with our last panel of the day. Let me see what this panel is called. This is Sourcing Local to Create Contemporary South Louisiana Sound. Uh, thanks to everybody who's been here all day, and if you just showed up, welcome for the first time. And it's, it's been a, a pleasure. I hope everybody's been enjoying it. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to our moderator for this panel, and he'll do all the introductions. So uh, hopefully all of you know, you probably already know uh, this guy. He, you, you definitely know his voice if you've never met him uh, in person. And uh, this is Carl Fontenot. He's the engineer for uh, KRVS, which is our local NPR station. Can I get a little appreciation for that? Thank you. Broadcasting live from festival, yes. and then uh, the fundraiser next week. I take it. So, so remember that you clapped and make make your call. So here we go, Carl Fontenot. Thank you, Pud. And uh, once again, as Pud just said, I'm the chief engineer for KRVS, and as many of you already know, we have been doing local Louisiana music for as long as I've been involved. And I first started doing things with KRBS back in 1985, and I've been the engineer there since 1999. And we've just enhanced all our local creativity since then. But just to get to the panel of what we're talking about today, you know, sourcing local to create contemporary South Louisiana sound. Uh, what we have really quick, it's Mr. Milton Gilbo, Mr. Frank Kinsel, Mr. Chris Stafford, Mr. Jason Harrington. And I'll just start from my side on and just give you a little bit of information. Mr. Gilbo builds pedal steel guitars. He first heard a pedal steel guitar when he was 10 or 12 years old, and that was sort of Hawaiian music. And that sound really interested him and he wanted to learn more about it. Well, as time goes on, when he really first heard it was around 1954, Webb Pierce had a tune called Slowly and that's what really made the mark. From that point on, Mr. Gilbo decided he was gonna learn what that was, he was gonna learn all about it, and he ended up building them, and went on for years and years building them in some interesting ways, and that's what we'll find out about. Mr. Frank Kinsel is a, I first met him as a jazz musician, let's call it, and Frank has been doing music, I don't know, how long? All his life, but, what you'll learn about Frank when he talks about the drumsticks that he makes is why he started to make those, the reasons for them, how he makes them, and how they benefit with his, the way he does it, the procedure, and what it's used for. It's quite interesting. Now, Mr. Chris Stafford, next to that, Chris is one of our, let's call him the illustrious musician of our culture. He's one of the first generations of French immersion students. Look, I don't say that lightly. I have a huge respect for you. But Chris started as a, a child musician, let's call it. Founding member of the band Fufile. Then they went on to great things. And Chris has been through every iteration of that band. Not only performing, but recording, producing, is now going on to owning his own studio. Records not only Cajun and Creole music, but all other types of Louisiana music, and presents that to our culture. On the end, we got Mr. Jason Harrington, and that's Lullaby Sound Design. Is that? That's perfect, okay. And Jason is a musician as well, but got more interested in the sound that he needed to acquire. So in order to acquire that sound, he started to build his own guitar amps. And the first one he did, Took him time and time and time and time again, changing, resoldering, unsoldering, until he got what he thought was the right combination. And from then on, it just blossomed. And you can see he brought some examples of his work. And Jason will talk a little bit about, you know, his theory of why he builds that kind of amp and what it can bring to a player. So now you know a little bit of the, the history of these guys. And I want to open it up now to any question. And you can detail that question to anyone you want. So if anybody has a question about steel guitars, 
drumming and drumsticks, performance recording or guitars, amplifiers, and playback. Anybody want a question? If not, I got some ready to go. Okay. Could you tell, oh, I, I was just interested in the drumsticks. It looks like one uh, set is darker. Yeah. Oh, maybe not. It, it might be the light. Okay, uh, so they're the same. We, but could you tell me the difference, is, if there is a difference? On drumsticks? Uh, most drumsticks, uh, industry standard has been hickory. <laughs> hickory is one of our hardest hardwoods in North America, and Hickory also has a natural shock property to it. It can withstand abuse. That's why you see a lot of hammer handles, shovel handles, axe handles made out of hickory. So the bulk of drumsticks now are made out of hickory. Um, other, a close relative in the hickory family that we have in Louisiana is pecan. Um, it's a little bit less dense than a northern hickory or anything north of, say, Alexandria, you know, along, in, in that, along that line in the United States uh, up to the, um, the western side of Louisiana, straight up the, the country. Um, so hickory's the, the wood, different uh, sizes of stick affect the sound, so the diameter of the stick can affect the sound. The, the, the taper of the stick can affect the sound. The diameter of the neck, which is just behind the tip, can affect the sound. And the tip also affects the sound. On tips, you can have what we call teardrops, which are elongated, pointy tips. Then there's an acorn tip, which is very similar to this. Um, there's also a ball tip, an oval tip, which has a little more meat on it. Um, let's see, what else? There's a handful of tips, you know, probably seven or eight tips that affect the sound. So there's a lot, there's a lot more that goes into a drumstick than maybe a lot of people actually think. Frank, while you're at it, give us a little history about why you first wanted to build your own drumsticks. Um, I don't know if I really wanted to build my own drumsticks. Um, I had an idea about drumsticks that essentially one night I was up, I've been involved in music all my life as I'm telling Carl. Um, I got a drum, I got a, my first drum when I was 10. I was beating on bots, pots and pans before that through childhood and played drums. My first bass drum pedal, my father and I made it in the shed. Um, built it so I could actually have a bass drum that I'd found a drum in a, the trash. Um, and with the drumsticks, it came out of me working on drums and I wanted to, I worked in retail, music retail for 13 years and I wanted to make drums, build drums. Um, and the more I got to, th I'd made a handful of them and the more I got to thinking about it was that if I made a drum for Carl, and it was a thousand dollar drum, when am I gonna see Carl again? He's gonna buy a drum, that drum's gonna last a really long time, and I might not see him again. So I started thinking about a wearable item that I could make for the community, and it's a drumstick, they, they break. And so I, one night I was up late, and I decided I would just look for an old, lathe and normally these lathes that make drumsticks were used in the furniture industry to make uh, chair back spindles um, things of that nature there's no chairs here with spindles like I'm talking about but I think you I think you probably know what I'm talking about and it's a production machine so I've I actually looked it up and there was one on Craigslist and so I started negotiation with the owner and um, essentially what it came down to after a, new, a year of negotiation was that I got a phone call and he says, uh, are you still interested in that lathe? And 
yeah. And he said, well, if you don't take it, no pressure, but if you don't take it, it's going to the scrap, it's going to scrap. And so I decided that I would acquire this lathe and knowing nothing about, really nothing about making a stick. I'd worked with a lathe when I was in high school, um, but this was a different animal. It was a production machine. There's nobody around to show me how to use it, so it, that kind of, that's where it started. And, and how long ago was that? Uh, that was about four and a half years ago. And from that point, where are you today in making drumsticks? Uh, in drumsticks, it took me about th three or four months to get knives made. I had to have knives specialty made by, there's one machine shop in the United States that still made the knives at that time. And I had the knives made. So about three months I had tooling. About three months I actually had a first drumstick which I don't have one with me, but it was very crude, very rough. Um, and I started giving them away, getting people to play them and see how they performed. And from there, I actually had to invent some of my own tooling. Uh, a lot of the tooling in the industry is very expensive and I don't have a lot of money. I'm a musician. Um, and so I, I started being innovative and in, in making my own tooling. Yeah, so effectively you created your product and you brought it to market. And, yes. And you're at the point of how many drumsticks can you make a day? Well, I started, I started with one model and this was you know, four years, about four years ago and now I have over 30 models. Um, in my shop, uh, I just had a part-timer part come in to start helping me. Um, and we could, if we pushed it, we could probably make about 400 pieces a day. Um, that's, is that a product you're able to move pretty good? Do you have sales, distribution market? Um, the, the sales are there. One of the biggest hurdles that I've, I've had to overcome is raw material supply. Um, since we don't have, since hickory isn't a local hardwood, I have to import it uh, from a distributor out of Ponchatoula who gets it from a kiln operator in Tennessee. Mm -hmm. And then I'm also, I just started dealing with a distributor out of Alabama that does hickory distribution as well. So really you have to get it north of I-10? Uh, yeah. North of I-20 pretty yeah. much. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well thanks Frank. Sure enough. Okay, any questions for anybody else at the moment? Okay, we have one here. Mr. Milton, did you have a lot of false starts before you successfully produced such a complicated instrument, or did you start with more simplistic versions and build up? I started <clears throat> way down the line with the one string guitar <laughs> that I built myself. And I, I, last night I did a replica. It took me about five minutes, I'll show it to you. It won the pedal steel guitar. I was interested in steel guitars. I'd, I'd hear the Western Swing and the Grand Ole Opry. And uh, there was a favorite of mine here by the name of Papa Cairo. There's any old people here besides me that remember him. And uh, he'd play at T. Maurice's, which is uh, near the Bosco oil field. I had two older sisters, my dad, take him over there and not go just to watch Pop Cairo play. And one night he broke a string and I watched him. He replaced it and threw the old one, the broken one on the floor. So I watched it until they left and I picked it up, got home the next day. I got a piece of two by four, two large nails, bent them backwards so I'd, I'd get them in tone. And this is, this, this was my first get, steel guitar, not a pedal though. Give us a little more history about um, how you first built your first 
pedal steel guitar. Okay, my first pedal steel guitar was, uh, uh, I had a triple neck Fender, 1954. And uh, let's see, I have a picture here. Anyway, I, I broke it down. No, first of all, I added one pedal to it, have a picture here, and it would pull two strings. You had to tune it from the bottom. Very crudely built. I had no tools except a drill and maybe a file and things like that. I bought the pedal from Lopez uh, Piano Shop on General Mouton Street for one dollar. He had some spare parts, you know, and this was my first pedal guitar. Then later on, I broke it down. I took two sets of parts and built my first pedal guitar. Uh, I didn't have any woodwork tools, so a friend of mine, Leroy, built a, we call it a trough. It's just a piece of wood with the uh, two uh, uh, front and back part. That's it. And so my name is Milton. His name is Roy. So all guitars had a name, like Showbud. This is a Milroy. And it had four pedals. Each pedal pulled the one string only and raised. There was no, you wouldn't flatten. That wasn't developed yet. Do you remember about what year was that that you uh, did that? Yeah, this is, uh, this is about 1955. I bought the guitar in 54. And of course, it, it became the pedal guitar, as you said, came popular in, in uh, 54. And uh, that was it. And then I, I went to other guitars. Now, as you, as you continue to build guitars, um, you mentioned about using parts that you would find from the business where you worked for so many years. Yeah, I worked for a plumbing wholesaler for a total of 54 years. And of course, I didn't know anything about building guitars. I knew about selling toilets and septic tanks and pipe yeah. and so forth. So I'd find little parts here and there on the shelf, and I used a lot of toilet parts, lavatory parts. And uh, up to my latest guitar, which is on display at the Hilliard uh, Museum, I have, uh, like on this one here, uh, 12 knee levers, uh, let's see, eight floor pedals, one wrist lever, and one thumb lever, palm mm -hmm. lever. And every lever does something else. You raise strings, you lower some. Some of them, the same string, you might raise two half tones and, and drop two. In combination with other pedals, knee levers and flow pedals, you might be moving seven strings at a time. Yeah. So, Over the years in uh, building these guitars, did you sell a lot of them? Oh, no. Or? Well, I sold one, this one here to a friend of mine from Crawley for $200. Yeah. And much later, I um, mean, you know, several years later, I said, I, I shouldn't have sold that guitar. I'd like to keep it. The uh, instrument, like everybody knows, is kind of like a pet. You don't want to get rid of it. So I asked him, would you still have it? I'd like to buy it back. He said, no, I sold it to th these two guys. I don't know where they are. That was a long time ago. So going back a little bit, one of my favorite players then on radio was a fellow played with Doc Guidry on uh, KVOL. He went by the name of Roscoe. I didn't know his real name. I knew he was from Lake Charles. And many, many years later, maybe 30 or 40 years later, uh, this guy was in the business. People around here might know Mr. Bud Chandler. He had a lot of mu uh, uh, a music store and he'd repair guitars and amplifiers and so forth. So this lady called him from Lake Charles, and she said, my husband died, we have a lot of parts for sale, come on down and sell them really cheap. He did, and uh, he was leaving, she said, here's a, a, a can, full can of uh, steel guitar parts. She said, I don't need that, I'll give them to you. So he got here, he called me, come get these parts. He told me the story, and I went there, and uh, first of all, th that guitar, had two necks, but only one of them had uh, eight strings with, with, with these handmade, these, this is part of a shower door rod that, that I used. And it, in, in, the, in that bushel, in that basket of parts, there were eight of them. 
the other seven at home in my shop. They came back so tightly that this guy, Roscoe, probably bought the guitar and later on maybe tore it down to build something of his own, you know. Well, full disclosure, I need to, the guy who bought the Milroy guitar was uh, my instructor in trade school in Crowley, so I knew about that guitar. That's something we discovered just yeah. when we were talking earlier. Okay, any more questions for anyone at the moment? Okay, what I'd like to do is move to Mr. Chris Stafford. And Chris, you began as a musician. Yeah. Um, when did you first, I don't want to say learned music, but when did you first realize music was your passion and that's something you wanted to continue to do? Uh, I mean, I was playing music, I guess you could say professionally when I was like nine years old. So pretty much my whole life, I mean, my parents were always like, you need to focus on school. And I'm like, okay, whatever, but I'm just going to play music anyway, whenever I get older. And, you know, I went to college, didn't, didn't finish. I was just like, what? I'm just going to play music. It's been my whole life. I've just been obsessed with music and it's all I've really ever wanted to do. But you've been able to make it a career. And at this point, yeah. besides performing, you can record as well. Tell us a little bit about how you got into the recording and then how you started your studio. Yeah, well, um, see, I've been in the band Fofale since uh, the age of like maybe 10 or 11. And uh, we made records way back then. And I just remember really enjoying the process of recording when I was very young. I, it was just very interesting to me. Um, my parents gave me a four track recorder that recorded four tracks on mini disc. I had that in my bedroom throughout like middle school, maybe sixth, seventh, eighth grade. And I'd make just my own recordings of me just playing accordion and fiddle and guitar, like, you know, playing every instrument. And uh, I just really liked it. And then in high school, I got like this 24 track digital audio recorder. And I'd just make recordings of myself just playing a bunch of songs, doing covers or whatever. And then um, I think whenever I was in college, I kind of started getting more serious about it. Um, Chris Segura and I lived together and we had a, a studio and um, I started kind of recording other bands and doing records for people. And uh, then I kind of took some classes at UL and kind of really focused on really learning how to make recording sound really good. And uh, and just kind of started doing it professionally, I guess. How did you go about acquiring gear to do this? Because uh, if you do cool and vintage stuff, and it's not just Cajun Creole, it's all types of Louisiana music. So how did you start finding that kind of gear? Um, well, I bought a lot of it kind of little by little and really kind of lucked out and got good deals on a lot of stuff. And then... One other thing that's really cool is whenever you have a recording studio, people say, hey, I have this uh, whatever, do you want to use it? And so I've been very fortunate. People have, have lent me instruments, microphones, all kind of stuff. I still have a lot of stuff that, that's borrowed, you know, because it's expensive to have a studio and I don't have a whole lot of money, but um, I think it's it's kind of a matter of just like, if you have pretty nice instruments and a good sounding room and you mic them correctly and the performance is good players playing well the equipment can kind of you can kind of mm -hmm. get by with whatever really but it's nice to have nice stuff too you know but do you find yourself staying pretty busy you know does it get in demand or or do you have um lull moments and then busy I, moments i definitely do have lulls usually during the summertime i think a lot of people um either just like musicians are usually on tour during the summer and a lot of people leave because i guess because it's so hot here they get, they go on vacation or whatever but usually around this time fall and then throughout winter i usually have a lot of projects in the studio so yeah. okay and, and we'll get back to you in a little bit but yeah i think i have more questions does anybody else have a question yes sir. hey chris um hey you know how like daniel lenoir has a certain sound and when you listen to it, no matter who it is, Willie Nelson or Amy Lou Harris or who, who's ever recording it, you can say, oh, that's a Daniel Lenoir sound. Are you developing a Chris Stafford sound or have you 
sort of found one where there are certain elements that kind of make up your sound? I think, yeah, probably. I mean, um, I think whenever you record music and you mix music, it's inevitable that you're going to put your own stamp on it because really what mixing and recording is is just making things sound the way that you think they should sound, kind of in a way, you know? Um, I like a lot of recordings from the 70s, which is, you know, kind of real dry drums, like fat snare drum sounds, uh, you know, just real real big and kind of fat sounding, I guess, is kind of the, the way, you know. So I, I tend to kind of record, try to record drums that way. And I mean, really, drums, I guess, are kind of like the basis of um, a lot, of, you know, kind of what gives you your sonic signature when you make a, a mix happen, you know. Um, so yeah, I kind of like, I close mic a lot of things. I do use some room mics, but I think my sound is kind of like very kind of direct and focused and I tend to kind of like want to capture things in a very like, um, kind of immediate kind of, um, real way, I guess, you know, do you like the mics close to the first it, de it depends. Yeah. Um, I mean, I do do some room mics like on electric guitars, you know, obviously every time I record a drum set, I use a room mic, but it's just kind of blended in and compressed and just tucked in underneath to kind of like give it a little extra kind of vibe and feel, you know? Yeah. Chris, yeah. Chris, I, I share your sentiment in, in what you try to achieve in that recording. And I call that sound present. Present. Yeah. I like that the vocal to be present. Yeah, it's kind of hard to describe, but yeah, yeah. that's yeah, that's a good way to put and, it. And thinking about subjective sound, let's move over to Mr. Jason Harrington, because what Jason builds in guitar amplifiers is very close to what you were asking there. It's a signature sound. So one thing I would ask of Jason, and all the things that you've done when you started to build these amplifiers, were you looking for a signature sound? What, you know, what were you trying to achieve Initially, at first, I just wanted to make something that worked, and, <laughs> and once I did that, that got exciting. And then, little by little, I started being able to figure out what made things change. And then, as I, I kind of, as I stumbled through those things, I, I I'm not trained in electronics. My background's uh, basically music and art. So my education's in art. So I come at this more from that perspective than from a engineering perspective, and. Um, in doing so, it breaks a whole bunch of rules because I'm, I'm with you, Chris, and that, I, like, I love that sound where it's, it's right at the point where it sounds like it's about to break. Yeah. And, and, and really what we're hearing when we hear that is we're hearing something in the signal path failing to some degree. We hear something that is struggling, whether it's a, in, in, in the case of these amps, it's a tube. Um, by engineering standards, tubes are far inferior to transistors in terms of what they can do and um, how you, uh, as I say, I may have said that wrong, but what I mean is there's a certain way of thinking about amplification where proper amplification means no distortion, means no coloration of the signal. So almost like if you were to play a hi-fi, you wouldn't want your amplifier and your, your, your speakers to completely change the sound of the record that you're putting on. You know, you want it to sound true. In an instrument amplifier, I think it's very different. If you plug an electric guitar straight into a, a stereo amplifier, it's going to sound terrible. Because electric guitars sound pretty terrible. Just acoustic, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, they do. They're thin sounding. And, mm -hmm. But you want, um, in a, what, a, what a tube can do that a transistor can't do is um, it can respond as it, as it um, reaches a point where it, how, how would you say, um, not struggles, but kind of. Like it, it, you reach a point where it, it, it can't handle much more. And Saturation would be that's the That's exactly, that's exactly right. Um, and in that spot is where all this sweet stuff comes out, all these extra harmonics, all these extra tones that we can hear Sometimes it's almost imperceptible, but I think as humans, we feel that there's something, something organic going on as, as its imperfections are being exposed by basically pushing it. Um, and I think that, to me at least, is infinitely more interesting than uh, something that can just amplify a signal perfectly every time. Yeah. Uh, I was 
Look, I, I agree because in terms of stereo reproduction, mm -hmm. if you want your home stereo, hi-fi, you want purity of audio, you need a clean sound. Right. But that clean sound has to reproduce the tonal textures that any instrument presents. And all of you guys know that is right. th that tonal texture is where you get the feel, the sound, the signature, all of that. So at the risk of getting a little too technical, and I was warned about this, is not to get too technical, you know, what you can do in your circuit path is add levels of distortion in each path between preamp, between mid stages, between finals, and each little bit adds a tonal layer to it. And it depends where you push that signal. If you push it on the front end, if you mm -hmm. push it in the mid stage, or if you push it on the final end, it changes that sound completely. That's so, exactly right. So it's a matter of, do you design something to where it has a specific signature sound, or do you design something that is um, usable and changeable by the artist? That depends. So I, I think it's I think of it in two terms. Either some some artists don't want any audible distortions. So pedal steel guitar players, for example, typically don't want their amp to distort whenever they hit low notes. Fiddlers, same thing. A lot of accordions also. Guitarists, on the other hand, are harmonica uh, players or someone who wants a lot of embellishment to the tone um, are going to want something that's going to give more coloration. So in a case like that, what I'll tend to do is, is try to figure out where the artist, what they want the amp to do whenever they dig into it. Um, so essentially, it's rather than trying to overcome the limitations of the technology, I try to exploit the limitations of the technology so that we can get to the point where the tube is right at its point of um, not being able to do its job. And in doing so, that's right where it sounds the best. And that's the, you can, you, you know what I mean, when you tone into that, that spot where you, you, you hang back a little bit with your pressure and it's, it's, it's smooth, it's clean, and then when you dig in, it's almost like, it, like when you scream. Your voice changes when you scream. It's not the same voice as when you speak low. Now, if when you screamed, it just sounded exactly like your speaking voice, but louder, it'd be kind of weird. And I think guitar amplifiers are the same, so that whenever you dig into them or you, you push them, they kind of break and they crack. And it, 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 to my ear, at least, and to my experience playing, it feels a lot more um, enjoyable to play that way because your, your dynamics become a part of the sound and become a part of the tone. Yeah, you're, you're just on the edge of that tonal distortion, let's call it, Correct. and if you can work that into the sound without getting too aggravating. Right, you know. and without needing a bunch of buttons or, or, or pedals or anything. Um, I think modern things are, are more starting, not starting to, it's been for some time, but I guess, and I guess there's multiple ways of thinking about that, but of having multiple channels to where you can click through different channels. Whereas I'm, I, I come from playing an acoustic instrument first, and with an acoustic instrument, you make different sounds with the instrument based on how you play it. You know, you, there's no other setting on my acoustic guitar to make it sound differently. Um, and so I want the amplifiers to be able to do that same kind of thing. It's, it's essentially, it's one channel, it's one, one, one signal. A lot of times you don't get any tone control or anything like that. You just plug in and then you dial in to the point where you can roll back a little bit and you can have your clean sound or you can dig in and it's as saturated as you want it to be. All with just a cable in your hand or with a pick if you really want to have some extra stuff to carry. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Any other? Yes, sir. Do you just predominantly make amps for guitars or for uh, fiddle players? Uh, well, both. Uh, actually, I've done some for uh, even vocalists and things. It's, uh, it's hard to get a lot of volume um, with tubes without using a lot, but um, I've done some preamps for vocalists and things like that. Um, but not only guitarists. There's a, I think there's a lot of more more young people starting to play um, fiddles and accordions and, and lots of different instruments. Um, so I kind of I, I I spend most of my thinking. I think I find the most interesting spot to be that continuum between a clean tone 
and a saturated tone and kind of moving along there. So depending on what you want it to do, um, it'll essentially amplify whatever you plug into it. So if, they, if you have a quality instrument where there's, you can, you can hear the, you know, that's something that we had the fiddle discussion earlier and I was exposed to a lot of that that I wasn't familiar with, that a, a really high quality fiddle is a, a very different experience than playing a, 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 you know, a lesser fiddle. And, and it, there's, there's things that you can do that you wouldn't have been able to do on, because the, the instrument wasn't refined enough to, to pick up on it. Um, so I think getting these right to the point of, and that's kind of getting it to that point where when you dig in, do you want it to break up? Do you want it to squish or saturate or compress? Or do you want to just be able to keep pushing it and it just get louder and cleaner and louder? Um, and, and there's, you know, there's a happy medium to all of that. Mm -hmm. Any other quick questions? Okay. Yes. Do you custom design an amp for a particular client for the sound they're trying to achieve? I do. So the first thing we do is we usually sit down and, and we'll, we'll talk about the kind of um, what they're looking for in an amp, what kind of places they're playing. Uh, one of the biggest things uh, with, ampl with but particularly tube amplifiers, to get them to that point where the tube is giving up the goods, as I like to think of it, you have to turn it up pretty loud. So the power rating is probably the most important thing. Um, some of the best amps in the world are higher powered, you know, 40, 50, and 60 watt amps. And if you're playing at a small club, you just can't make that amp sound good because you simply can't turn it up loud enough. So um, knowing where a person intends to use it is oftentimes a big deal as well because it kind of lets you, it get, lets you get to that, that sweet spot at a volume that's going to be usable and you know, suitable for where it's going to be taken. This is true. Well, it's funny you mentioned um, Bud Chandler. I, um, I, I never had the uh, privilege to meet him, but um, a few years ago I was contacted by uh, a friend of the family, and I, I was able to, um, after he had passed the, the, his shop behind his house, he had kind of pulled everything out, but all of his old um, file cabinets and all these things were there, and they asked you know, if I'd want to come and reclaim any of those things. And so I went, and, and sure enough, he had tons and tons of tons of, he wouldn't throw anything away. Um, I, I say he wouldn't throw anything that was useful away. So before uh, something was deemed to be irreparable, he would pull all the knobs off and put them in his knob box and pull all the tubes out and put them in the tube box. And so there was a pretty good backlog of just parts. Um, that said, for modern tubes, the only places they're still making them are Russia and China. Um, which are, um, so the quality is, um, they make good tubes, I guess, still. It's kind of, uh, I think the quality control probably isn't what it used to be. Um, but they're, they're still available. Okay. One more question. Sorry. Hey, I, I was wondering, Mr. Milton, did you ever try to wind your own pickups? Was that something that you considered? No, no, I didn't. In building the guitars, a lot of manufacturers buy pickups from other companies too. Some of them make their own. There's a lot of companies uh, that are now gone. Uh, a lot of companies are real small. Uh, real good brands are no longer there. Just like we lost a lot of great players in the last very few years. Uh, up I think the pedal steel guitar we're talking about mostly was probably the youngest or one of the youngest instruments in the world. Uh, you know, like violins and keyboards and everything was centuries old. But 1954, in my opinion, is when the pedal steel guitar evolved. And before that, there were some pedal guitars that didn't work. Uh, you'd press a pedal, like Alvino Ray was one of them, just didn't work. It kind of changed the whole, uh, whole tuning, but you didn't get the, the sound, the beautiful sound, like uh, one steel guitar said, the pretty sound with a certain pedal, you know, like it is today. And there's one guy, 
he died two years ago by the name of Buddy Emmons. And in my opinion, he's the best uh, was and ever will be. If it wouldn't be for him, steel, pedal steel guitars would be uh, 25 years behind. He developed so many things, tuning string gauges uh, in amplifiers. He invented things that uh, other people took credit for, like a talking machine and so forth. And there's some other great, great players still living, like Paul Franklin, fantastic. And I'm glad to say I got to know all of them pretty good through the years. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Hey, Carl. But cover your ears. <laughs> Uh, it seems to me that um, I'm, I think about the popularity of um, sound. We're talking about sound. It seems that uh, our culture has moved to, um, it's almost like a, a popularity of a visceral experience over the hearing experience. And I wonder, I'm just curious, so we got uh, drummers now, it's like uh, in a band, put a mic in a drum, <laughs> it's because that's, you know, everybody wants to have their sound, the sound of their instrument balanced with every other. Depends on who the leader of the band is and their relationship with the sound guy. <laughs> you know, it's like this. <laughs> or if, if they have their own independent amp, you know, you go along and it's like, well, well I think I need to turn that up a knob or two. I'm just curious about you guys as musicians and as sound engineers, just this concept of um, pushing sound to uh, where it affects the body more than what's comfortable for the ear. So I, I, know, I know that it's, as, it's very difficult to play whenever you don't feel that your playing is filling up the space, is supporting you. So in other words, if, you, if the volume is, is simply too low, for at least personally, I find I have a hard time performing. It's almost like it's, it, just, it, it just doesn't feel right. So there's a, a comfortable volume, I think, where everything starts to, to compress, I think is a, the right word. And essentially, it depends on the size of the room. It depends on how many people are in the room, all these different things that affect the acoustics of the um, the room, um, and if you put something too loud, you know it's that y'all know what I mean. You've all we've all been in that room where you just can't hear anything. It all just all kind of garbles together. But then there's a there's a, a a great spot a little below that where all these certain tones all kind of blend in and kind of make this stew. And then uh, you know the, the 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 vocals or whatever the focal point is can pop right out on top of that. But everything else in the room is complete and full. And, and I think full is, uh, I'm sure you know, do you want to add anything to, to this? Do you ever play somewhere where, like, where they, they make your fiddle sound in a way that when you play, you're like, that's not me? Um, as, a guitar, as a guitar player, they make me turn down. All right. Which is the worst. It's like you hit a guitar, you hit the string, and it just, like, the amp can't really put out. And there's something about, like, Electric guitar, I think, is supposed to be loud. You know, it's because like you're moving air from the sp from the speaker. It's an experience, and it's part of your performance is the way that the amp's responding to the guitar. You know, so it's like, yeah, you have to be right. loud think, enough. You know, I think, I think about it like in, in your car. If the, like the idle's too soft on your car, when you press it, nothing happens. You know, and that's how your that's how I, an amp needs to be. Whenever you get in it, it needs to go. And, and if it doesn't, then it's hard to, you know, repeat that without feeling, I, I find I feel a little haunt, you know, like you just can't, yeah. can't make it go. Um, but. Well, well, you know, it's interesting because it, it's a delicate balance that you have to deal with, with the volume that you need to get the tone that you want to present the feel you have versus what the listener or spectator can handle and what the room can handle. Well, and, and that's, that's, these amps in particular, this, this amp is five watts, this amp produces four watts, and this amp produces about seven watts. 
So uh, by comparison, a modern amplifier is probably rated at 100 or 120 watts. To, to make a 120 watt amp sound like it's on the verge of breaking down, we would all be deaf in this room. Um, these, on the other hand, five watts is just about enough volume to play in here, you know, with a good, nice, gritty tone. Um, but you can turn it all the way up to that point, and um, if you won't be, you won't shake the, you know, I think about it as killing the termites whenever you, whenever you really get nice and loud. Okay, one more question. Yeah, to, to sort of carry on with that theme, I, I book bands for a dance up in Kingston, New York, and uh, Cajun Zadico series, and there seems to be a basic conflict between the volume the band wants to play at and the volume the listeners, the dancers, want to listen to. I, I find I, I, I stock earplugs and give out lots of earplugs at my dance, and some bands are, are uh, approachable about lowering the volume to where it's tolerable for some people. I lose people. I have people walk out. It's too loud. I can't stay here. And I'm concerned. I wear hearing aids. I don't want to lose any more of my hearing. And I know that the sound the band's playing at is damaging people's ears. What, what is that? Why do the bands need to have it so loud? I, I think it's, it's that, that, that to get the tone in, it, it, you know, from a drummer's perspective, Frank could probably speak on this. Frank's a, Frank's a wonderful drummer, and um, he's probably got the most dynamic range of, of or at least in the top. Per we can play a, a restaurant with Frank with a full drum set and eat meals next to him, and, uh, you know, you can eat. Um, well, you that know, said, some some guys feel I think get into it a little much, and it, it's hard to it's hard to get that energy without having the volume. Yeah, we can address that point a lot, especially when we're talking about Louisiana sound. Mm -hmm. We have lots of different types of musics from Louisiana, from Cajun French to contemporary Cajun to Zydeco, which is traditional or contemporary Zydeco. And that's where we're finding a lot of cultural advancement, we might call it, in sound, because that sound has changed drastically over the last 10 to 15 years. And you know, that's what a lot of, I don't dare I say older generation, but like if people in my generation, where I'm getting to the point of, I preferred a traditional sound of Zydeco. Now what it's moving to is still good and cool, but it's not what I think is acceptable in terms of sound. So, but I don't feel it's incumbent upon me as a spectator to go up and tell the band, your sound is not what I want to hear. But it makes a lot of sense for a business owner to be concerned about that at, at their yes, establishment, yes it does. you know. That, absolutely. Okay. You know, I'm not sure that this is not a band issue as much as it may even be a sound man issue. Because sometimes the sound man, I, I can't tell you how many times I've either been in shows that I've been involved in or just even as a spectator have gone up and asked the sound man, do you really want him to sound that loud? <laughs> so I think in, 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 the band may not even know that they're playing as loud as they're playing. It may be the sound man who is the culprit in this case, you know. And uh, dancers should just technically wear earplugs, really, when it gets right down to it. You know, it should be part of their, you know, the, the knee thing and the earplugs is all I'm saying. <laughs> I'd like to say, I'm a musician, plus I have used to run sound for about four or five years. And you go to places like Patrick said, the, the band might not know they're that loud, or you might have one instrumentalist that are blowing everybody else out. And that's where a good sound man needs to mix it or go up and tell them, hey, you need to turn down or, or turn up, you know. And I'll leave a venue if it's too loud or a bad sound mix. I think that's probably the whole thing is the good balance between the sound man and and the musicians. No, I have an analogy. What what if artists, painters, used pigments that were so bright that they would cause blindness in the people who looked at it? Imagine somebody comes up and says, I've got a great exhibit I've been painting. I can barely see. I'm shopping for a seeing eye dog. 
well, I would love for you to come and see my artwork, but it will damage your vision. That sounds insane. Musicians are constantly playing at volume levels that damage their hearing. All you have to do is go to the OSHA website and get a, get a decibel meter app for your phone, and you'll find out that the volumes they're playing at, they're damaging their hearing, and then it becomes a vicious cycle because the musicians are deafening themselves so they can't hear how loud the volume is. They turn up virtually all the sound men I've ever worked with have at least some degree of hearing damage. I play all my gigs, have ever since years ago with the Sleep at the Wheel, with Max Pillow Soft earplugs. That's why I can still hear. But to me, it's unconscionable for musicians to play at that volume level. Yeah, you know, he makes an interesting point about a work hazard. As, as musicians and you play and this is your livelihood, that's something you need to protect is your hearing. But we may be getting off on a completely different subject here about <laughs> hearing and listening versus creating the Louisiana sound. One thing I want to do, I, don't, I know we don't have much time left, but do you guys have any questions of each other? Anybody want to know anything about the steel yeah, guitars? There's a future pedal steel guitar player. Probably, I didn't know he played pedal steel guitar. He has one. Oh, tell what kind of pedal steel do you have? Tell us about it. What kind of pedal steel do I have? Mm -hmm. Well, I got it on Craigslist. Did not have a name on it, um, but I'm pretty certain that it's made by this guy, Chet Wilcox, who was selling steels on eBay. He makes kind of like a, a pretty cheap steel, but it's pretty good, it's not bad, you know? And steel guitars are expensive, and there's really kind of only one cheap one that you can get. I mean, really cheap is kind of the Carter Starter. You can find those used um, for like around 700 bucks or 500 bucks. Um, I got this guitar for $500, and it's, I think it's a really good deal. I don't have a lot of money, so still guitars, I mean, they're like $2,000 or more, you know? So, um, yeah, I mean, up to 5000 if you have a really, you know, just depending on what you get. Um, so I think 500 bucks was a good, so, you know, three floor pedals, four knee levers for 500 bucks. It can't beat that. It stays in tune, okay? It's, you know. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, well, we've discussed, let's see, what time did we go to, Pud? Is it time to wrap it up? I guess that's the question I'm asking. Oh, yep. Hey, can I say real quick? Sure. I just want to let everybody know. I brought these for everybody here, so if you want to leave with some drumsticks, you can leave with some drumsticks today. Free samples, compliments of Frank. Well, oh, one more question? One last one. I do actually have a question for Frank. Um, as far as seasoning and drying your wood, do you do any of that here? I know you had mentioned like one of your suppliers uh, uses a kiln, but... Um, myself, personally, I have not... Uh, dried lumber yet um, for drumsticks. I do have um, a cypress tree that is milled and stacked in drying, air drying, and, a, and two cherries and some wadark that I got from a gentleman um, that he asked me if I could make some sticks out of it. Wadark is actually harder than live oak and they say it's probably one of the two hardest hardwoods in North America. Uh, I know they use it in instrument making. I'm not sure exactly what parts would be made out of blood arc. But on, I do know that to dry, air dry lumber, it's one year per inch of thickness on the board. So if I milled a pecan tree for drumsticks tomorrow, into one inch boards, it wouldn't be ready till next year for me to make drumsticks out of it. Okay, cool, thank you. Well, Milton Gilbo, Frank Kinsel, Chris Stafford, Jason Harrington. Thank you.
At this time, we're supposed to have some sort of closing remarks. Um, all I really want to say is thank you. Uh, thank you to all of the audience, all the people who've been in attendance. Thank you to everybody who's talked, um, not just these folks, but the, from all the way this morning. Um, thank you for, to Festival Acadien at Creole um, for helping sponsor this. Thank you to Vermilionville for hosting us. Um, you know who you are if you've done something special for us today. Uh, thank you to my staff at the Center for Louisiana Studies, uh, Chris Segura, Pud Sharp, Jennifer uh, Ritter Guidry. Um, hope to see everyone at festival. Um, hope everyone gets a chance to go to the exhibit at the A. Hayes Town House at Hilliard Art Museum. Uh, and please, uh, please remember to, uh, to uh, show your appreciation for, uh, for our, our panelists today and for the people who've done their hard work. Thank you.